Okay, let's continue our pawn structures in depth and look at the Shaveningen pawn structure. So this is typically coming from the Sicilian Shaveningen variation. So black has swapped the C pawn for white centre pawn. So the D pawn's missing and the C pawn's missing. Um, so within this, strategic plans for black are often to, to use the semi-open C file, pressure on C2. Also, if white ever plays C3, then you've got a minority attack plan, uh, which, which, which aim to basically isolate white's pawns. So as an example, once the minority attack happens, white will have isolated A and C pawns. So that's the whole point of minority attack. It means also that an outpost for, say, a knight here is going to be um, easier and more effective to establish and to keep because it won't be kicked with b3 for example. So basically there's a minority attack plan, there's semi-open c file pressure. The flexibility of these two pawns though is also interesting. It can revert into a you know, transformation of Bolzlavsky hole if black ever played e5. We have that classic Bolzlavsky hole on d5. And in which case if black had a light squared bishop you'd be trying to trade that off with your own light squared bishop. So you're getting those off and then establish a big knight on d5 for example. And then often if you've, if you've got an attack it will often help play itself if you've got a big knight on d5. We've seen very dramatic examples of that from some of Chernev's games, instructive games. So it's all based on pawn structure and as I said in my video earlier this morning, I think the Bolzaski is the, is the most strategically clear-cut weakness of all the structures where you can completely crush the opponent's counterplay by making use of this hole. Um, if black plays with d5 and white played e5, the weakness that white generates is f5 and this is easy to underestimate. I got smashed myself in a British Championship game earlier in the year when I played too casually with e5 from, from an earlier sort of b3, I thought I was playing an innovative system, but he played into this sort of French defence advanced structure where White's encouraged to play e5, and he got a fantastically, you know, wonderful knight on f5, and then my counterplay went downhill. So this can be strategically, you know, damaging for White if Black establishes a nice knight here. And also, and there's beautiful examples in history of, say, Capablanca outplaying the great Nimzovich in this kind of structure, using the c file to sort of get into um, Nimzovich's position and f5 as well and you know Nimzovich had no counterplay whatsoever so these structures uh, can be transformations from this uh, Shaveningen structure so this is you know needs some some great care to handle this structure properly let alone the minority attack possibilities if you have a play c3 or the, the semi-open c file pressure generally so what are white strategic trumps well there's d6 to attack sometimes on the semi-open D file, but often you know whites should be able to you know switch rooks in and, and go for the attack sometimes with F4 F5. The problem is as soon as white plays this sort of plan of F, F4 F5, um, black sometimes gets the E5 square and can like stick a knight on there. And if he beats off your attack, again you're going to experience pain, positional pain, lots of it. So that's why you can't just simply go and hack the opponent's king with this structure. There have been other games where white first plays you know e5 and then plays f5 so this assumes that there's no knight to you know recapture that you can get away with f5 and that would be a dangerous attack on the f file and I think we've seen an instructor game from Adams where he eventually sacks on f7 so that exposes the black king to an attack. I think there's a game Adams against Topolov I did with, with that kind of theme with e5 first and then f5 so if you look at you know the instructive game examples, you'll see this structure echoed, the spirit of this structure and the implications it can have. So there's various you know themes for white and themes for black, based on this, this flex flexibility. In terms of the end game, sometimes white can get an advantage, three to two um, pawn majority on the queen side can create a pass pawn in the ending. In terms of king position, if white is castled on the on the queen side and black on the king's side, then, then white is often more tempted, assume the king on c1, to play, you know, the English like attack system, you know, ram all the pawns up, play for g6. If you look at my game against Marugan, I had this sort of English attack, or the English attack has been 
um, a, a very effective weapon for many British grandmasters, where you know where the kings have castled on opposite sides in the Shaven Ingen. And maybe that's contributed to, to some, um, you know, a sliding in popularity of the, of the Sicilian sh Shaven Ingen in general, that it's, it's quite a, a comfortable system to go for a crude, you know, type attack. And the English attack, you know, w w sort of borrows some of the ideas from the Sicilian dragon where you cast thing on the queen side and just trying to batter the opponent's uh, king. And you've got this structure where you, your e4 is supported by the pawn on f3. So these are things to bear in mind for white and black, the strategic um, elements of the position. And the, these are the elements where, you know, the strategic crush that, you know, I, I suppose will occur. So um, the shape in England structure is, is fascinating, it's dynamic, it's flexible. And it can, can take you by surprise if black liberates, in t you know, correctly with d5 or e5. They can get some important strategic trumps, which um, it's very difficult for you to play after. To, to have counterplay. Um, I'm not sure what else I'd, I'd like to say at this moment. If, if there are any other ideas, I think I might do a part two video at some point in the future. So please leave any comments or questions on YouTube about this structure. Thanks very much.